Tucker, how you doing, buddy? Hey, man. How you doing? Who are you talking to? The world, basically. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to say 7 billion because I assume North Korea can't access this, but I'm, I'm probably talking to 90%. No, no, that's ridiculous. 5% of the world owns a computer. Is that true? It's only 5%? That's what I heard. Yeah. When, remember when, phones. when Thomas Friedman was talking about the world is flat? Yeah, I missed that. He I assumes that everyone is just online in India and Africa and that entire interview. <laughs> Peru. Now, I did recently read that the average West African spends like a quarter of his entire take home pay on a cell phone. Really? Yeah. That's a good business to get. Isn't the richest man in the world the Hispanic dude who runs all Central it's and South Carlos American phones? owns the New York Times. Oh, he owns the New York Times yeah. now. Wow. Pretty good. Would you like a nicotine lozenge? Uh, no, thank you. I've never smoked, never will. Really? I don't get it. You know, smoking's not as fun as trying to quit smoking. That's fun? The nicotine replacement therapy, yeah, it's good. There's a variety of tools. You've got your vapes, you've I, got your I've fucking... Used every one of them. There's not one nicotine replacement therapy I haven't used, from the patch to the vape to the lozenges to the gum. And what's the gum? It's like seven bucks a pack? I buy mine in New Zealand on <laughs> eBay because it's not childproof. So you can get to it. Right. It's and delicious. It's how much delicious. is it? It's about maybe 300 bucks a week. That is insane. Yeah, so it's like a parking space. But unlike a parking a space... A parking space in the most expensive parking city on earth. Yeah, but I mean, as compared to a parking space, you get a deep sense of satisfaction, any nagging feelings of self-doubt or self-loathing or ameliorated. I mean, it just really, it forms the basis of your joy. Oh, wow. So it doesn't just cure smoking, it cures all ails. Well, it, it cures unhappiness, basically. And the question really is, are you ready to be happy? I mean, this is the question most people never have to face. They assume, yeah, I want to be happy, but they don't really. They choose unhappiness again and again and again. I, by contrast, have chosen happiness. And that's in nicotine gum. That's exactly right. There's no downside that I know of. Well, the financial part is... Yeah, but it's worth it. Why do you work? Well, I do drink... Uh, when I'm drinking, it's, you know, the bill's always 40 bucks for a few Maker's Marks. No matter what. No matter what, yeah, you end up buying the other guys or something. It's see, I quit drinking and just went right to, right to nicotine. All right, sold. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're sitting here with Tucker Carlson. Is this actually going? It's live. Oh, God. <laughs> fantastic! That's why I said I was talking to the whole world. <laughs> I had no idea. It's absolutely live. That's was hilarious. any of that a secret? No, I'm not, it doesn't bother me. Well, you said, who are you talking to? I said I'm talking <laughs> to the world. I thought you were kidding. I, I would have said there. if I was just talking to a camera. <laughs> hilarious. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover Great today. Uh, we've got till 11. So why don't we just dive into it? Let's right? do it. Um, you've got a, a long and feathered career in media. Just invented that adjective, by the like way, it. for that. Uh, one thing I find inspiring about you is you have like 30 different careers. Yes. I keep getting fired. You keep getting fired and yes. you keep getting back on your feet. And I, I always feel like... I'm some sort of warrior for having maybe two, but then I look at your background and you've, you've been to the top of the mountain five times. Yeah. And then fell off. I, I think having a lot of kids young is the key. That's the key. I got key. married at 22, had a ton of kids. Before How many kids we got? Four. Four. And they all needed to be educated. And, you know, at that point, smoking weed is just not an option. You have to get out of bed. I want to bring that up too. I want to talk about uh, boarding school. Uh, in a second here. So you think having kids early gives you that drive you need oh, to absolutely. never fail? Yeah, I mean, people are, well, speaking for myself, I am profoundly lazy. Uh -huh. Like, literally, you know, donut eating cop asleep in the patrol car lazy. Really lazy. Have you ever been without the kids for and the wife for, say, 30 hours? Yeah, totally. Oh, I guess every apart. weekend when you're in New York. immediately fall apart into indolence and unshavenness. And so you, in your hotel room, you just sit around in your underwear eating yesterday's hamburger, which was still on the ground, oh. watching an X-Men you've seen three times now. I would do that, but I, I'm so paranoid about wasting my life uh -huh. because you do die at the end and I'm 45 and so I feel like, you know, probably not here forever, that I set up things to do constantly. I, I cannot just sit and waste time because it, I feel so anxious about death. That doesn't sound lazy. Well, I am lazy, so I'm constantly fighting against it. It's like if you know people who are in middle age and still really thin, it's not an accident of biology. It's not because they have faster metabolisms. It's because they're terrified by the prospect of getting fat, 100% of them. They hate food. They're 
I mean, I don't want to use the term eating disorder, but they are like obsessed with not eating too much food. You're talking about women. Yeah, but also they're dudes. I mean, in TV, there are lots of people like that. So it's intentional and because they know they could be fat. That's the point. And I know that I could just sit around and, you know, I don't know, do something pointless and then wake up at the end and think my life is over and I didn't do anything. And that's that's a terrifying prospect. That sounds like bullshit. I swear to God, that's true. I think you like the idea of being a lazy guy, but you're just... I really am. Like... Oh, it's unbelievable. No, lazy guys fall asleep watching TV with the spaghetti in a pot, and then they wake up, and they flip the spaghetti over, and it looks like a seal's stomach. It's still sort of blanched on the bottom because it didn't dry out. <laughs> and then they just start that's eating disgusting. that because the top is dried out. Now, if that's foreign to you, then you're not a genuinely lazy guy. Well, I guy. have a, a lot of kids, and I've been fired, so ever since I got fired... I really took work for granted. I, I started out in, in print, not making any money. Then I accidentally got into TV and made, of, by my standards, a lot of money. And then I became completely entitled and lazy and distracted. And then I got fired and I realized, wow, entitlement is really ugly and counterproductive and disgusting. And I will never be that way again. So I was scared straight. You remind me of that dude, Adam Mark Smith, who was on TV the other night. He's the guy who went to Chick-fil-A and said to that woman working there, you should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, you're working at a homophobic institution. And then he put it up on YouTube. <laughs> he lost his job. He lost a million dollars in shares. He's Whoa. been unemployed for three years. He's on food stamps, which I don't get. And he wrote a book called The Million Dollar Cup of Coffee. I mean, a uh, million dollar cup of water, because he went and got a water at Chick-fil-A. Wow. Uh, and you're looking at him going, why don't you help people move or be a man with a van or something? Right. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I do think about unemployment, having been unemployed, and I'm, I'm sure you know the feeling. You can get <laughs> into a spiral where, you know, you are feeling sorry for yourself. I mean, self-pity obviously is the enemy of action and happiness. And you can start to, like, get into the woe is me thing. And then you get into a spiral of loserdom where you just, like, don't do anything. Well, I am a pervert. Well, that that's helpful. So that is is helpful because if you stay at home and grow a beard and wear a bathrobe, your wife becomes disgusted by you. Yes, that's true. And fornication's out of the. At least with me, I'm not going to get laid. Right. So even me leaving at 9 a.m. and walking around the block for yes. five hours is more sex than staying at home. So I just rent an office and start that's a new project. That's so useful. So perversion is the nuclear reactor that drives you forward. Well. Gene Simmons said all music is driven by sex, and I would argue everything is driven by sex. Civilization itself. This is how you know that women don't actually hate violence. Men have wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what's so amazing about Free the Nipple, where they're trying to desex. <laughs> have you heard about this? Yes. They're trying to desexualize breasts, oh, but breasts now. were created of course. through evolution because we were walking upright, and women were saying, hey, stop, my eyes are up here at my tits. Exactly. Stop looking at my ass. <laughs> also, what's the point of an Oedipus complex if you can't be sexually obsessed with breasts? Well, yeah, what's the, why are you desexualizing them? Because you want to walk around topless and you feel vulnerable? The whole thing is ludicrous. Go bananas. If women, if, and I, this will never happen, and I pray that it never does, but if men actually treated women as they treated other men, which is the stated goal of some of the most unhappy feminists, Women would hate it, and rightly so. You know? Oh, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, because I was just watching last night, Ari Schiffer is in trouble, because he mocked another comedian who has is fat and is missing one arm. And uh, he said, God, this girl I know, he says her name, I forget her name, Damien Marcells or something like that. She's, she's not an accomplished comedian at all, although I think she works regularly at the comedy store in L.A. because they see a fat woman with one arm, and they go, we need to check that off the box. She no, has no comedy chops whatsoever. It's another Trevor Noah situation. Anyway, yeah, but I think it's Ari Shafir, by the way. Ari Shafir. And do you remember, the, can you look up the name of the one-armed lady? And he mentioned that she has one arm because it's a very identifiable trait. It's like if there was a cop describing a sure. robber, he would throw in that she was missing an arm. He, he might say yeah, he she might had long that. eyelashes. Yeah. So <laughs> he goes, this woman's annoying. She has one arm. She's fat. And she had that fat smell. And then he talked about how hard it would be to wash if you're super fat with one it's arm. It's Damien or Damien uh, Merlina. Yeah, that sounds right. Damien Merlina. So I'm watching his set because I want to see what she's in tears. Every female comedian is crying with her. It was a horrible attack. It was unprovoked. And I'm watching it and I'm like, this is how we talk to each other. Yeah. It is. Like when I would go in my old company with my buddy Sebastian, who's a very handsome man, much younger than me, looks like a Greek god, and we would be looking in the mirror, you know, at the hotel, we're getting ready, and he would go, look at you, look at you, you look like a raisin, 
You look like a, you're a million years old. Look at those <laughs> crow's feet. And you, you're, you look like a worm who was rubbed around on the floor of a barber shop. And then he goes, and look at me. Look at me, a Greek, a, I'm an Adonis. Look at this hair. And I, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> you know, I don't go on a blog and start crying. That's how we insult each other. I know. We had a guy in high school who had mental illness. He was schizophrenic. He went in and out of mental institutions. His nickname was Crazy Ryan. <laughs> Did he ever recover? I don't think so, no. See, oh, no, he did. He did. He has a kid now and stuff. He probably be really, he wanted to kill me because I let it out that he was crazy Ryan about 10 years ago. So I'm sure he's going to be back in my life very soon. <laughs> Lock the door. Here's what I'm for. I'm for treating women differently from the way we treat men. I am. I'm not for playing along at all. I have instinctively protective feelings toward women, yeah. obviously, including my three daughters and my wife. But but I like women actually in a very in a genuine way, not just a creepy way, though that way too. But <laughs> but in a in a warm way and but in a protective way. And I'm just never going to treat women the way I treat men. And I by the way, I mean that as a compliment. I in a lot of ways I prefer women. Well, that's the irony is us sexists like women more than feminists. And in our world, they're more protected and safer and less raped and yes. less hit. Well, that's than how in I feel world. anyway. I feel like we have an obligation to have that attitude toward women, but I also feel like it grows out of an instinct that is inborn. I mean, it is in me anyway, and in every other man I know. I don't live in Brooklyn, so maybe they're so evolved there that they just see women as dudes, but that's not the way I see them, and I never will, and I don't want to, and I think there's something really ugly about demanding that people do that. Well, the experiment, what I see amongst my peers in hipster land is the experiment has failed, and they're getting close to 40, their ovaries dried up, and they're fucking miserable. If the experiment worked, I'd be all for it. Right. But this pretending women are kick-ass, pretending that they're superheroes and they're tough and they're dudes, leaves them with nothing because they're not dudes. Right. No, that's true. And they are, in some ways, tougher than men. They're less sentimental than men, I would say. And they're definitely less horrified by the details of, you know, the human body and stuff. I mean, there are a lot of ways yeah. that women actually are harder but just not in the ways that we have to pretend. Not in male ways. Are. Exactly. They can't do chin-ups, but a woman can get a tattoo for three hours and be reading a magazine. Totally. A man gets a tattoo. I'm covered in tattoos, and still I have to, you know, take a Xanax and oh, it hurts. get drunk. Right, it I've heard. It kills. It's yeah. dizzying. But they just sit there and look at me like I'm, a, I'm at the zoo, and they're watching the pain exhibit. I've seen that. That's so funny. I've seen that exact thing. And having seen my wife give birth four times and you know, sweat breaking out of her forehead, and she said to me, I will not cry in front of someone I don't know. I will <laughs> die first. And she meant it. Wow. I mean, I'd be bawling like a girl. I mean, not like a girl, I guess. Anyway, there are so many ways that I admire women because they are different. And again, I'm surrounded. I live with four of them. And I work in TV, which is totally dominated by women. And I, I, I think, I mean, I'm being defensive. Like, I like women. So my best friends are women. I sincerely mean I actually really like them. And it's demeaning to pretend that they're just like my college roommate, Bob, because they're not. Yeah, do you Thank want, God. okay, we had a game, if you fart, and you don't say safety, and we call slut, we all get to kick the shit out of you, <laughs> no ball shots, and maybe a headshot or two, no kicking in the head, but violence, <laughs> until you can name five breakfast cereals. Now, you're getting pounded, so it's hard to think. <laughs> it's hard. Cap Crunch, uh, Life, pff, Cheerios, and, and then you'll say another one, and they'll be like, you already said Cheerios. <laughs> And that's the same initiation the Bloods and the Crips have. If you want to be part of that, ladies, the cis women who identify as men, if you want to change a carburetor with us, if you want to put lime on the part of the lawn where the pine needles are falling down and you have to neutralize the acid. Of course. And you don't want clover and moss going there, come on in. Uh, we can talk about Scott Seed versus that sort of pulp stuff. I which, hate the pulp, but it I don't works, think it, though. I, it, I've, it's worked for me. I've stared at that pulp for weeks. The crap. You mean the ground, green the ground, ground paper. paper pulp yes. with seeds oh in gosh. it. And you're looking at blue shit, too, I know on your lawn. Blue I don't green, like that. It's like aqua. I agree with you. But I did do it a couple times because it doesn't move when it rains. So if you're patching spots in the spring, this is a conversation that's not taking place on oxygen right now. If you're <laughs> patching bald spots in your lawn in the spring when it's heavy rain, it doesn't wash all the seeds off. No, but that you get that out of dried grass or hay or basically anything. No, you're probably right. Put down some nice topsoil, seed it, water it, put some topsoil on top of that. Right. And then just put some dried grass or hay or anything there to keep the birds and to right. keep it from washing away. It's probably you don't want to look at fucking blue all no, summer. No, you don't. You're right. Especially you August where you're not getting a lot of growth. No, and then it grow it just grows up like a hair transplant. You yes. Know, just too too tight together. Yeah, I or you know what I've tried a few times? Franken lawn. So you go to an area you don't care about that's yeah. that's already sort of written off because it goes into the forest. Rip that up. 
and go to your trouble spot and fucking plant it down. That's so smart. Speaking of hair transplants, you've got to water really, the shit out no, of it. No, you do. You really you're do. You're stamping on it. With and bare you have feet. to be faithful about it. You can't just you know kind of piss on it. Oh no, 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 no. That's your base. You it's like it. a transplant. I mean, it, 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 your body could reject it. You've got to. No, it's totally right. You got to check the specimen. Show up in a cooler. You I read a book on this up. once. That's how intense I got about lawns one year. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, I really did. We don't have big lawns in D.C., but mine was cherished. You understand, ladies? This is our world. Why do you want to be here? Okay? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> it's, it's Dungeons and Dragons. Same with politics. Uh. It's economics. It's all numbers. How many legals are here? What's the GDP? How is unemployment change? Why do you want to pretend that's your world? You're not. There's none of you in math because you don't have a predilection to STEM. Now, Larry Summers got fired for even asking why that is, but it's a fucking fact. And if you want to come on board for a week, try it. I noticed this, by the way, on Fox when you're on Outnumbered, and you said something incredibly controversial, which is it's different for a 16-year-old boy to get raped, air quotes, by a hot teacher in lingerie than it is for some disgusting old 40-year-old man to fuck a 16-year-old student. You think? You think? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not even in the same universe, actually. And and I don't, you know, I guess there are lots of things you have to play along with in life. And I understand society demands compromises. We all live together in close sure. quarters. A woman have. can win the Nobel Peace Prize for mathematics. No one's saying that's impossible. Right. That's right. And I'm, I'm not. And, I, you know, I'm not good at math. But I'm not. There is a limit beyond which I can't pretend anymore. And calling a, was in this case, it was a 17-year-old kid. <laughs> A rape victim because a, a teacher who wasn't even that old or married was kind enough to initiate him into the ways of adulthood. I'm just not <laughs> going to sit there. And my view was, having been a boy and seen this a lot, my best friend uh, was involved in a relationship like that when we were kids. There are not that many options. So you're a 15 or 16, 17 year old boy. You're, you are driven by biology to procreate. Yes. So you're either going to be inflicting your attentions on one of your peers who is, let's be honest, not ready for it. She's going to get hurt emotionally. 90%. I mean, I've never seen a woman not hurt at that girl at that age. Or you can have a safer, albeit technically illegal outlet with a woman who knows what she's doing. You're not going to hurt her. You know what I mean? Like, this is harm reduction. This is like a needle exchange. In the working class, one generation ago, a dad would get his son someone like that. Well, sure. Well, he would set it up. Clayton Williams, like who ran for governor of Texas, famously bragged, I think in a debate, that when he was a boy, his dad took him across the border to Juarez, you know, to a bordello. He, he lost the race, by the way. Because of that? I, you know, I think it was one of the many factors, but you sh you're, not, you're not allowed to, I mean, you, know, you shouldn't say everything out loud that is true obviously I mean, right. again one of the many compromises we make but i'm not going to pretend that that's rape because it's just not and it demeans and devalues real rape that's what keeps happening with this right versus left and feminism thing it ends up that your right-wing views about women leave them better off than the feminist version in the feminist version some beautiful 29 year old in lingerie with the little bows on the knees do you remember that one yeah She's she should go to jail. She should have a sex offender no. thing. And I don't think women understand how unfathomably horny you are from 15 to 20. Yes. I mean, you could cry thinking about a pair of tits. Yes. And proof of that is we because girls, my experience, and this is middle class Canada, they didn't really start like, all right, let's get going on this till after college right in till, their 40s <laughs> in canada <laughs> till 23 24 25 right but up until then for me personally you know there was good moments but a lot of it was sort of negotiating of and let's try and teaching and this that was is back when women had here. power i mean the irony is all this female empowerment has left a lot of girls hopelessly unempowered and it's right. really really i was talking to one of our babysitters about it the other day and she was saying in college you know, the expectation is you'll some guy texts you and you go over and service him and leave. No dinner, nothing. There's no expectation you'll get anything in return. You are just a commodity. And if you don't do it, someone else will. And I said, but that doesn't sound like empowerment to me. And she <laughs> said, no, we're very empowered. And I said, boy, that sounds like disempowerment. It sounds like you are powerless. Right. And she looked at me kind of quizzically like, really? And I think I hurt her feelings, but it seemed true. And by the way, yeah, that's a sex slave. About conservatives. Like, I, I'm not defensive about, I don't think, about my political views, but I, I will say you often hear, you know, the, the right hates women and everything. I run an office. We've got, you know, 50 people or whatever in it. And I can just speak for myself in saying I allow any kind of humor, any kind of, 
you know, harmless fun. You can say whatever you want in my office, whatever you want. We actually observe the First Amendment, but you can't hassle anybody. And if there was anybody in my office who was doing creepy stuff to female employees or female, I'd fire them immediately. Like I wouldn't, I have zero tolerance for that crap in real life because I like the girls in my office. But you can tell a vulgar joke. By contrast, all the sexual harassment I ever see in Washington is on the left. Yeah. It's in offices where everyone's, you know, so evolved and we care about women's rights and, you know, we'll, you get a free abortion when you come on board and all this stuff. They're all like Bill Clinton, like actually in real life, hassling real life women. Well, you look at the 70s and that free love was all about men getting more laid. Of course, always, the whole origins always. of the hippie movement was more poon tang for is. these fucking the hippies. The origins of every Conservatives, movement. by their books, don't really get that laid. They get to marry their high school sweetheart. That's exactly. I did, I can say. How many women have you had sex with in your life? A lot. Hundreds. Because you went, what? It was a short window, but I packed it full. <laughs> <laughs> you carpet bombed. Yeah, yeah, I did. Was it DC? <laughs> it was more like a, yeah, it really was. It was like a neutron bomb. Uh, I, I was on, uh, I can't remember where I said this. I think it was in Thought Catalog where I was fired from later. But I said, <laughs> you can hit a woman once for every 12 times she hits you. So boom, big, good hits. You know, bish, 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 and you're like, calm down, calm down, calm down, 11, 12. Boom. <laughs> And not a black eye, but like a chest punch or something. And then she goes flying across the room. You said that out loud? Yeah. Okay. I believe that. How did it work? Uh, well, the, the funny thing is the feminist said 12, more like one. Fuck you. What, you think we can't handle it? And I'm they going. They did? Yeah, I do think you can. And then the conservatives were mad at me because the number was so low. They're more like 1,200. Or actually, the truth is they said never under any circumstances. So the feminists, the danger of this work kick ass means, okay, you're going to get punched oh, I know. in the face. Right. So real freedom is like serving on the front lines. Why, I, when I, I remember being in Iraq and talking to the one time I went into the green zone, some PIO, some idiot colonel telling me about how beautiful it was. He'd just been in a field hospital where a woman had her legs blown off. And I was like, ugh. And her husband showed up and he was there when she died and she gave her life for her country. And I thought, that's beauty? Watching a woman get maimed in war, that's disgusting. It's disgusting. And that's not evolution. That's devolution. That's, that's like going backward into, you know, barbarianism. That's horrible. I'm never going to look. That's not the deal. That's not what that's we. disgusting. And when you see them on a, Bill McGowan brought this up once. When you see them on a poster and it says the proud, the few, and three of them have a skirt on. I don't like the jihadists seeing that image. Well, I kind of like the, mid scary. the middle finger quality of it, though. I don't think they feel that. Maybe if they get bombed by a female fighter in a jet, but when they just see a woman carrying a clipboard in a dress skirt, they go, this is what you're going to do? Well, speaking of celibacy, they're probably totally just like halted in their tracks by the sight of an uncovered woman. Just the knees. Yeah, just the knees. God, it must, one thing about Saudi Arabia, just not to get off track, but it must be so fucking awesome to be looking at burqas all day. You come home, your wife is wearing... Gucci, Louis Vuitton, five-inch stilettos, because she doesn't get to do this. Oh, of course not. So every night at home is the Academy Awards. Her hair's all crazy, and she's like, hello. But that's not what really happens, because you don't come home until like three in the morning, because you spend all night sitting on the floor, eating lamb with your hands. <laughs> I'm serious, with <laughs> a bunch caffeine. of your friends. Yeah, drinking little cups of super strong coffee and working your worry beads. Like, you never go home. Yeah. That, have you been to the, the Islamic world? I mean, that no. all the men sit around and play backgammon, which I love, use tobacco, which I love, but still, they're always with each other. When do they when do they procreate? That's true. I noticed that with China. You'll be walking. I lived in China for a while, and you'll walk by. It's everyone's up at all hours because of the tea. Yes, and just you you look <laughs> in the tea. No, they drink more tea than anyone on earth. And you look in a window, and you just see guys gambling all night, and you think, don't you guys want to get laid at some point? <laughs> it's like those Alaskan wild family where they have the weird Duff rockabilly accent. You know those guys? No, you... but I love it already. It's I a reality show about a family who lives in Alaska in the middle of the woods. And half of them are young 25-year-old boys. And they've lived with their family their whole life. So they've developed their own accent. And they say things like, hit me five, because they don't know what is going on. <laughs> they sound like Europeans. Right, you and Ukrainian like, immigrants. Dude, I moved out when I was 18. Go get laid. What happened? There's a crisis in this country, a sex crisis. I know there is. Getting laid has been ruined. 
We've cheapened it, and they're either have total apathy about it, or they're doing it so much that it's just become this diluted, wet. Well, there. You know, it's interesting. I employ a lot of really young people, and I notice that there's very little sexual anxiety among the young men I deal with. Yeah, like they're not plotting and planning for the next hookup. It's like that's a given. They're giving away that stuff in my world. I mean, there's Tinder. Like, you know, I'm not. I know I'm getting that tonight. So, like. I'm not worried. I don't know. I, I'm not arguing for anxiety, but I do think there's got to be a cost to that. So for millennia, men have worried about when am I going to score, and now they're not worried. Like, that's a massive well, change. But the jury is still out on how late they get because there's two – I'm getting two signals from these youngsters. One is sex is everywhere, and I get anal on the first date. The other is I don't – I'll just masturbate. I don't really need it. Well, there's that. I, I keep meeting virgins. No, I know. Who are 21. I know. If you were a virgin in my generation at 21 – I think you might get killed. You'd be beaten until you could name five breakfast cereals, that's for sure. Well, that's for farting without <laughs> saying the proper verbiage. I think you might just get stabbed. I do. Because we'd be convinced you're a Wiccan or some sort of I know. demon. <laughs> I got to say, I don't I don't know much about this, or it, but I do think that porn has changed a lot. And I don't really under, again, I don't understand, but I'm a huge believer in the obvious truth that massive societal changes have consequences you can't foresee and some are good and some are bad but they're always like m multiples of these consequences and they ripple out through the decades so we didn't have porn 30 years ago that was available to everybody instantaneously in the back of a cab on their iphone and now we do so like that's not going to change human behavior or human relationships it is in a Maybe, big way it might for the better it I might mean, no it might i'm I get saying, some great ideas from nobody Red Tube. talks about it though that's so interesting like this huge change, and nobody ever mentions it. Oh, no, I've heard it. I've heard it's oh, a problem have? with young women where their the expectations are too high. I've read articles about oh, okay. young girls having to do anal. Right. And anal is like, that's like asking a guy to do a triathlon. I right. mean, it's not impossible, but it's a big deal. you got to train for it. Yeah, it's not. You know, just I read The Vice Guide to Anal Sex written by one Gavin McGinnis. Oh, that's how we met, right? Yes, that was such a good piece. That was Thank you really very much. smart. I mean, it wasn't... It was, the, it was the guy to eating pussy, though, that we bonded on. I like that, too. But it, they, they, this wasn't... If you haven't read the... I don't know if we're, we're actually being watched right now, but if your viewers who haven't actually read those pieces, so smart, not just like pornography. It was like actually thoughtful and deep. Well, I think that's an artist's job. His job is you are busy laying bricks. You're busy, yes. you know, accounting. I'm going to go out there and do some stuff and take notes. Right. So I didn't enjoy a, maybe a year of pussy eating for that thing because I'd be going, oh, this technique, I forgot that I do yes. this and was conscious the whole time, not losing myself in the vagina and was able to pen that for the bricklayers. If you could sum up what you learned. Oh, easy. I'm glad you asked that. We are so horny that we're sort of like bulls at the rodeo. The second the gate comes open, we're going, we're going, let's go. Yeah, ah. That's right. Women are totally different. I completely agree. It's like a lamb in a field. You have to go, hello, hello, shh, hello. And maybe from 40 feet away, maybe have some lamb food. <laughs> and go, hey, Buster, hey. And then just take your time. I mean, right off a good 20 minutes. Sometimes you got to give them a fucking massage till your hands hurt. That is so smart. And that applies to everything, even pussy eating. You don't just come in like a pig at the trough. No, that's true. So I recommend coming in and doing absolutely nothing for maybe a minute just to add an air of suspense. So you're just sitting there. <laughs> and she's like, what? Did he die? What is going on? You know, we when we first <laughs> met, <laughs> See, it was... I think that's these are... I mean, let's just take the sex part out of it, the salacious part out. As an observation about women, that's like brilliant and true. Yeah. And I've noticed that with arguing with my wife. Like, I can't just burst in with a rant. No, 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 no. She just backs away. Or, or how about when a woman comes to you, your wife comes to you and says, I'm really upset about this. Your instinct, obviously, is to, okay, here are the five things you need right. to do. And that is, no matter how many times you learn that lesson, you always forget it. And it's, she doesn't want to hear your stupid, even though they may be accurate and useful, recommendations. She wants you to be quiet and just, like, listen and empathize and say, you know what? You're really suffering. I get it. Right. Well, your attitude is always is always like, what? No, tell them to fuck off. <laughs> and if they get mad, then they're not your friends. <laughs> what? Done. Next, next challenge. <laughs> Do you have a happy marriage having gathered all this information 
and really being an insight, I think, an insightful voice on this question. Have you been able to apply it successfully at home? Oh, uh, I broke, my wife and I split uh, a couple years ago. A couple of years ago? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I have a great marriage. We just had lunch. We were just talking. <laughs> it's like, what? Uh, I, had a, I was thinking about that on the way over here, though. I have a great marriage, but it has downtime. And because I'm in for the long haul, yeah. I can just say to myself, and this has never happened, but I could say to myself, we're having a bad year. This is going to be a bad year. Yeah. I could not, she, I could not get laid for a year. And well, that happens when she's pregnant. Yeah, well, yeah, I notice. You know, because it's not like you get laid the day after the baby's nope, born. No, <laughs> no, you don't. There's some like medically prescribed period, as I recall. And when I see these guys with young kids and they're divorced and the kids won, I go, "You can't, you can't have a bad year." People move to other countries. I agree. They learn the language. Look at all immigrants. They come here and everyone is going meow 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 eating food that you've never seen, and they just go, "I gotta learn what meow 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 is," and I have to eat one of those weird meat sandwiches that looks like a fat baby's ass. It's called a hamburger. It looks like a baby taking a shit. Okay, no problem. And you can't have a bad year. I agree completely. Completely. Well, it, it's making me start to think that people without kids shouldn't be in positions of power and we shouldn't pay attention to their opinions. Well, and I, you can't I, say that. That's at, a conclusion I reached some time ago. No, I, I actually think people without, you know, I know a million great people without kids, but I'll tell you this. I would never go for life advice, real life. You know, I'm at a juncture and I, and I don't know which way to turn. I would never go to someone who hadn't raised kids for the answer, not because they're not good people or immoral or something, but because unless you've been forced at gunpoint, which is basically parenthood, to focus on something other than yourself, you're missing a key element that adds up to wisdom, in my opinion. Well, here's the problem with that, though, because Ann Coulter, for example, mm -hmm. is childless. Love Ann Coulter. And she's just such an expert on everything family. And she will openly say, I'm one of the bad ones. Like, I, when I criticize people for not having kids, I'm guilty of that. I'm, yes. I'm part of the bad things I'm talking about. It's a shame, because I would love to see a lot of little Ann Coulter. Oh, almost without that. exception. We had John Joseph from the Cro-Mags here the other day. He would have been a great dad. Almost everyone who doesn't have kids because they're too busy or that they're not ready... It, would have been a way better parent than the ones that did. That's for sure. But the problem with that mentality about uh, you can't do it if you have any kids, it's like when blacks say you can't talk about racism because you don't know what it's like. And I always use the example of ESPN where these guys had not played professional sports and they're talking about sports. If you've done your research, you can talk about things. Well, sure. So it's a contradiction that I have to reconcile where on the one hand I think, why am I – like half the time I'm on a panel, I'm looking around and we're talking about – parenting and I realized I'm the only one here with kids yeah I know and I got in an argument with Tom Shalou about this the other day I said I don't want a president who doesn't have kids because he doesn't have skin in the game there's no stakes I agree like I, I let Ann Coulter get away with it and this is hypocritical of me but when Bill Maher is saying you know new rules and this is how it's gonna go I think what the fuck do you care when you're in the ground you're in the ground you don't have to worry about your legacy you don't exactly. have to worry about That's about right. the, uh, specifically the debt that's not an issue to the childless because they're done in a few years. Of no, that's literally true. That's right. And it gives you a different perspective on everything. But being drawn out of yourself and just for a second to take the focus off yourself, the relentless focus on your own well-being is just a really good thing. It's good for you. It's good for your soul. And also, when you have kids, you suffer a lot more. And out of suffering comes wisdom and joy. I, I believe that. In fact, that's the only place it comes from is suffering. Yeah. There's such a thing as parental abuse. I mean, I was hit this morning. I was hit in the eye with a piece of Lego. <laughs> I saw, though, you had a huge advantage on. I'm taller than him, but they will get you in the eyeball. Well, you just beat the snot out of that kid, though. I, I do beat. I throw them around like a rag doll. We have a game I play with my son called You Owe Me 100 Bucks, where I just pitch him and I throw him on the one. We have an L shaped couch and I throw him on that. Give me my money! Give me my money! And you can just. It makes the wife gasp. But they can really take a... The angry landlord game? <laughs> yeah, as long that. as... you got to watch your couch because some couches have a little bit of a steel lip under yeah, they, the padding. Yeah, so they do. I found it back when I used to drink, <laughs> yes. But, but our couch is all pad. It's, it's great for that. But, okay, let's change the subject here because we have things we have to get to. We're already winding it up. For real? Controversy. Uh, you talk, you talk about the Daily Caller where you, where you work. You yeah. also work at Fox. There's some... Every time I mention Tucker this past two, couple weeks, they go... Why did he let Mickey Kaus go? He was one of the good ones. Yeah, I agree. He was a liberal that was on our side. He was a smart liberal who thought analytically. I agree. He would win in arguments with conservatives. He made us better. 
I really like Mickey, and I certainly admired his, and do admire his intelligence and his ballsiness and his willing to say what he thinks is true. You truly. admire his balls? No, I don't. I have no contact with them, no knowledge of them. But his ballsiness, the oh, okay. the, the courage of, of his writing. Because um, balls have no variety. They're always... You know, I haven't... I Honestly, I'm pretty ignorant on the subject. Okay. Um, I say with pride. But um, what happened was he wrote a piece going after Fox News for um, not being vigorous enough on immigration, not being anti-immigration enough. And I said to him, look, I'm, I'm not going to run it, and here's why. We have two rules. You can't criticize the families of our employees, and you can't criticize Fox. And he's like, well, why? You know, why? Because they're right wing. And I'm like, no, because I work there. Ah. They're my employer. I'm an anchor on Fox. And well, that's a conflict. It's a total conflict. Because I'm the co-owner of The Daily Caller and I'm a Fox employee. That's an inherent conflict. I don't know what to do about it. I didn't inherit millions of dollars. I can't, I'm not, you know, self-financing my life. I have to work like everyone else. And, you know, I work at Fox. And by the way, I like Fox, but we attack lots of people I like. The distinction is lots of people I like. And they always call me about it and their feelings are hurt. And I, whatever, I deal with it. Because I let my guys write whatever they want. Except that. And I, I don't know what to say. It's a it's a, I guess, a bad situation. My only defense is I'm honest about it. I'm not lying about it. And I've had many editors who've killed stories or held stories or changed stories that I've written because they, unbeknownst to me, went after someone near and dear to the editor or to the owner. And no one ever explained it to me. And I resolved that when I was in charge, I was the editor in chief, I would be totally transparent about my decisions. And that's it. I work there. You can't criticize your employer. That's life 101. And even if he deserves it, you can't. And if you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, well, it's hard to argue if you're admitting <laughs> that you did something wrong or you admitted, you totally. admit that it's a conflict. What's it? Well, of course it's a conflict. Well, of course it's a conflict. I'm, I'm a, so my only defense is <clears throat> I'm not a liar. I really try to be honest because why not? And second, I have more, I give more editorial freedom, I would say, to people who work for me than any other place I've ever worked for. So sure. was Mickey shocked? I'm surely all the writers know this. Of course, yeah. It was, and they hate it. I'm sure, not that they're anti-Fox necessarily, but writers, by definition, hate the idea of being circumscribed in what they write about. It. And I get it. I feel the same way, um, and I sympathize with them. But again, the only remedy and my only explanation is just total honesty. And I work there. And if you don't like it, you know, I hope. And I said to Mickey, boy, I hope you don't leave. I I argued with him to stay. I think you're great. I don't always agree with you, but. I actually do agree with most of what you say, and I really like you. Please don't leave. And he said, I'm leaving, and I, I felt bad about it. Yeah, there's a myth that he was fired, but he oh, quit. Oh, gosh, he wasn't. Not only was he not fired, I argue, I mean, I really tried to get him to stay, but he felt it was, it was an assault on his integrity, which I also understand. I'm not. But I would say, the only, I guess the only thing I would say about the way he left is it shouldn't be read as some, you know, a metaphor for the rights relationship with Fox News or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. There are millions of conservatives we criticize all the time and pretty, you know, I feel like we criticize whoever deserves it. And um, and that includes a lot of conservatives. So it has nothing to do with ideology. It has to do with employment, period. Yeah, I think a journalist's job is to offend as many people as possible up until going bankrupt. Right. And up until going to jail. Yeah. I mean, in as we talked about with Matt Welch the other day, a lot of Hungarians under Stalin did go to jail. Right. And that's admirable. But I don't think that's a reasonable expectation. No, it's, it's not. It's I'll spend it like I've lost a few million bucks. Yeah, I know. Criticizing, you know, sex changes and stuff. Right. But I still have money in the bank so I can afford it. But I'm not going to empty the bank account and leave the kids without a future. Right. To say some that especially when the taboos seem to change every five years. Well, and also, I mean, let's be totally real. I mean, you don't read a lot of pieces attacking the Salzburgers in The New York Times. No. I mean, there are so many sacred cows out there. There are so many figures who will never be criticized from Winnie Mandela, you know, to, I mean, you could, you could make a very long list of figures that the press refuses to criticize, period, under any circumstances. Oh, look at Trevor Noah. And we have none. We have none. Just Fox, because I'm a Fox employee. And if Fox ever fires me, then the ban is lifted. Well, you guys did cut the line fucking Jews from one of my articles. <laughs> <laughs> I was, it was a joke at the end of an article about meeting a Hasid and how he changed my mind about something. And I thought it would be fun uh, after, you know, learning so much about Hasidim <laughs> for me to say, as he walked away, I just thought to myself, fucking Jews. But the editor did not enjoy that. Ah! God, don't tell me that. 
Um, okay, well, the second big controversy with you is when liberals see Tucker Carlson, they go, that's the guy that Jon Stewart got fired. <laughs> and it's just accepted that he that's came in funny. there, had an awesome debate, crushed you, and was it Carville? Who else was in the room? Paul Begal. Paul Begal. Crushed you both, left you stammering. The head of the network, who, who, what's his name again? His name was John Klein. I think John Klein is perpetuating this rumor. Well, it's, you know, the, the bottom, here's what I learned, which was a super valuable, I was saying that all satisfaction and joy come from suffering. And this is a perfect example. I learned so much from that exchange. It, it actually changed the way I see the world in a good way. But w the main thing I learned was the more popular person wins. Period. It doesn't yep. matter. In the court of public opinion anyway, the more popular person wins. And Stuart, very talented guy, more talented than I am, and way more popular than I am, won. I, up until that point, was like rooted in the old sort of linear rational way of assessing debates. And I believed, and I still believe, that his position was like ludicrous and unintelligible. Like I didn't even understand what he was saying, and I still don't. You can watch it on YouTube and make your own judgments. But um, I will say as a factual matter... Not only did I not get fired, I had already quit um, when he came that day. I, that was in like the fall of 04. I was negotiating with MSNBC and I already told CNN that I was off of Crossfire. It had nothing to do with that. I was out. I'd been on that show for years, many years, and I, you just get worn out and I, I wanted to do something different. So, um, and I, I wasn't fired from CNN. Actually, I quit. Uh, the vibe I got from that debate was you invited a clown on like John Stewart wasn't really known as political back then he was more like just one another comedy guy like Jeffrey Ross mm -hmm. yeah so you had a funny guy on and then he attacked you for being too partisan and you both said, went oh, oh this is a political debate in well, fact I you was, said that you said I thought you were gonna make some jokes well I was totally confused I mean the, the other thing I learned that I didn't understand at the time was it's really easy when you're hosting a show to become really passive and bask in the adulation and all the benefits of being on television, but not actually take control of the show itself and let the producers do right, it. Right, yeah. And I, and we had a couple of producers, we had some great producers, but we had one producer in particular who was a pretty sinister guy and um, whatever. Anyway, I didn't even know John Stewart was on that day. I just landed from the West Coast. I was totally out of it. I wasn't prepared for it at all. But what I was really unprepared for was the allegation that I was partisan. I can't speak for my co-host, but... And I have a lot of flaws and they're all on display. But the one thing I've never been is partisan. I'm not interested in partisan politics at all. I would never defend someone because of his party idea. I've never worked in politics. I just- Who's a conservative you've criticized? Oh gosh. I mean, I, I spent- GW? Eight years going after Bush. Yeah, big Good. time. And I would argue he wasn't actually conservative, but whatever. I mean, yeah, I have all kinds of, I've never been a water carrier for the Republican party. Ever. And I would not even occur to me. I, my heroes are people who tell the truth regardless. OK, no matter where they stand. So but I thought the striking irony, which no one else seemed interested in except me, was that Stewart is actually a hack and had sniffed the throne of all these Democratic candidates and politicians on his show. Well, you know, John Kerry, it must be so hard to be so handsome. You know, people are mean to you. How does that feel? It's like he had an opportunity to ask real questions and he didn't. And I felt like, boy, you know, that's kind of dereliction of duty, actually. I mean, I'm not, you know, I had a lot of flaws. That show was bad in a lot of ways, and I did a lot of stupid things. But I've never done that. I've never kissed ass, ever. Okay. Um, let's, we've got a call here. Right, John? Mm -hmm. That's what you're motioning? We should set up a whole sign language thing. Yeah. Oh, you did go like that. That's pretty good. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if deaf people use that. <laughs> <laughs> When you're coming up with sign language, you must go, this is already a thing. Want to just use this? <laughs> uh, oh, I do? Okay. Hello, caller. Hello, d caller today. You're our daily caller. I don't hear anything. Well, this guy's drunk. Maybe it's a oh. sadistic mute. Did he hang up? He just hung up. Yeah. That, that guy's a... What did I say? Clearly caller? chemically dependent in some way. Oh, I called him the Daily Caller. I you called him the Daily Caller. He was enraged. He's like, isn't that the place that fired Mickey Couch for telling the maybe truth? Maybe it was Mickey Couch. He just clicked. Probably and he just thought, Mickey. I hate, when I hear that name, it's like skull and bone. <laughs> <laughs> I have to leave the room. <laughs> um, so the Stewart thing, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I, I never thought it was that interesting, but it, I mean, I've had a lot of on-air contratomps. That's for sure. I mean, that's what I did for a living. But uh, that assumed this kind of, he assumed a folk hero status and, after it and it was like this pivotal moment i never to this day i don't understand why it was why it was significant the thing I that drives me nuts it. about Stewart is he thinks that he's 
news. Like I've heard rumors he wants to start being a head of programming at CNN and get involved in a news station. He doesn't get, he, he started out as a comedian, right. then it was comedy news, and now to him it's just very pointed, intelligent news reporting. Well, I'll tell you this, he's obsessed with it. There's, this is one of the things I learned later talking to Stuart after the show and Ben Carlin, his producer, and then in subsequent years, you know, I've had a lot of people, a lot of people have come up to me and talked to me about it um, who work for him. That guy is like sincerely obsessed with cable news. Like he watches it every day. He, you know, has very strong opinions about the people on the air. I mean, he is kind of a frustrated news guy, I guess. And it's ironic because a lot of news guys, but I think O'Reilly and Ann Coulter, I think deep down they would love to be comedians. Of course, or, or, or I don't know. Brian Williams. Oh, Brian Williams, to. of course, he wanted to host the Tonight Show and asked to, to host the Tonight Show. So you're right. There's nothing sadder than someone who's pretty good at what he does who thinks he should be doing something different. You know, there's something really, I'll say in my defense, I'm doing exactly what I'm suited for and what I enjoy, and I don't really want to be doing anything else ever. And my only hope is to be able to pay the mortgage. That's it. I don't have like aspirations to like run the world. I remember Jay Carney used to be a friend of mine who was a Time Magazine correspondent and a good guy who traveled. I literally traveled around the world with him once and always got along with him. He lives in my neighborhood in Washington. He goes to work for Biden as press secretary or as a communications director. And I run into him at this restaurant, like two bucks from my house. Hey, man, you got a new job? He's like, yeah, it's the best. I'm in the meetings now, he says to me. I get to actually hear what's going on. And I've always wanted to be in the meetings. Oh, so he's conceding that when he was a reporter, he was just part of the Democratic Party. Well, sure. Who was doing their PR, and now he's the guy. Well, he's conceding, really, that he wanted to be closer to power. That was the whole aim. Right. He was and never I've a journalist. I've been self... I, I, I've never been interested in that. I've always been skeptical of people in power, like instinctively skeptical. Like, hey, people well, in power, you know? When people love Obama, I always liken them to the guy in your high school who loves the principal. Imagine how wedgy totally. he would get exactly. if he had like, like Principal Morris, number one principal ever. <laughs> he'd he would, be hanging from the wedgie nail. There's no doubt about be, it. He would never get to school. His underwear would be on the basketball <laughs> net and he would just That's become totally an right. icon. Like no, he would be a totally statue right. you'd see every morning. Well, it's just another symptom of just the shocking 1950s level conformity that we're living in right now. It's unbelievable. Get in line, obey. Do you have a different view from everyone else? It, it's so weird. I mean, I don't fully understand people, obviously, or human nature, though I spend a lot of time thinking about it, but like the paradoxes are remarkable. Be your own person. You're unique. You know, this endless Apple computer inspired propaganda about how each one of us has like a different, unique thing to say. And in fact, I see like people under 30 is like an army of robots who all dress the same, have the same thoughts, and who instinctively crush anyone who thinks any different from them. It's bizarre. I've, they're, it's, they're like the, the Red Guard or something in their conformity. It's weird. It is. Well, I think it, Greg Lukianoff says in his book, Freedom From Speech, that it comes from being physically soft and not having physical challenges. And that includes hard labor, but also getting fat and staying at home and playing video games. And that softness leaks into your mental ability because debate is exercise. And if you don't physically huh. exercise, you're not going to want to mentally exercise. So this war on free speech is a, really a war on things that offend you and cause you to exercise your brain. What an interesting hypothesis. I've never heard that before. Yeah, he's a smarty pants. So soft, doughy TV watchers are less rigorous thinkers? And Yeah, and he's not just talking about you know some 400-pound middle American. He's talking about youth today. I, I, I'm adding in this illegals taking all your landscaping jobs. Right, I agree. So you're just sitting around, and you're, you don't have that conflict. So you end up soft in every sense of the word huh. so when you get an argument like that's sophisticated like yeah they can light their tap water on fire but they've always been able to light it on fire that it becomes too much work and you just go get out of here like when larry summers said um maybe women aren't why, well, no he said why don't women have a predilection to stem is it right. maybe genetic one woman in the audience this is back in 2005 started having convulsions and said she was going to throw up or black out and i've heard this a few times with college students where they'll, they'll be a controversial speaker and they'll have a physical reaction where they'll it'll be like they're at a Baptist church and they're they're being cured by Possessed Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. 
But in a bad way. In a bad way. Possessed yeah, by yeah. demons. That's so interesting. It's hard to imagine that actually happening. I've read accounts of it many times. But well, it people... takes balls to go, to stop the debate and go, oh yeah, that's true. I never thought of that. that by the way, that happens to me all the time. I would say, at least, and I'm 45, I'm like, I'm like basically almost dead. I'm so old. There are at least once a year, there's a moment where I'm like, God, that's a real, you know what? I think he's right. And I was wrong. I change my mind all the time on stuff you should change it at least once a year about a major i do thing. i do i've gone back and forth in the death penalty like 11 times that's what i love about a good debate too like hannity and buchanan last night hannity goes you know they ignored hitler and now we're hearing calls from iran i pay attention to them because i don't want another world war ii right. and i go yeah and then buchanan comes on and he goes oh was that such a great idea we're fighting. Look what look uh, after the war. Britain was on American food stamps. They were bankrupt. All they had to do was form an alliance with France. Germany never would have gone anywhere. It was an unnecessary war. I'm like, yeah. No one's smarter than Pat Buchanan. That oh well, it was a beautiful. You know why that was such a great fight? Because it was a Scot and an Irish. And seeing those <laughs> two brawl, it's just like get the popcorn. Here they go. Though I think Pat identifies as Irish. Really? Yeah, he does. I know. I mean, you're a stickler for this. Um, he doesn't strike me. He's too smart to be Irish. <laughs> I heard a rumor about Pat Buchanan. I, I heard he has a special sibling. And I don't think it's Down syndrome, I but it's that's something right. that's yes, visible. That's true. Him and his brothers, and this, by the way, is a great example of the trouble with millennials because they will find this disgusting, and I think it is wonderful. They would take his brother out and go for a walk with him, and he'd be 10 feet ahead. So he'd be going, <laughs> going and get some candy. And then there'd be some townsies or whatever. I think he's from Boston. I'm not sure. No, he's from D.C. D.C. And yeah. they go, hey, fucking retard. And he would look down. His brothers would then come in and just hospitalize the guy. <laughs> <laughs> they would tear him to shreds. I think that's right. And that shows the retard that you're, you're not a piece of shit. And people who laugh at you end up just jam on the pavement. <laughs> Isn't that a great message? What kind of ratings does this get? I mean, this is like the most unbelievable thing I've seen in a long time. I would watch this. Where does this air? Wow. It should be a... Oh, th that? I thought you wanted to watch Buchanan beating no, no, up no, the no. bullies. No, no, no. I want to watch this show. I'll I send just, you links. I'll send oh you links. Gosh. Has if the, if the, the feds haven't tried to shut you down yet? This is actually a safe room. The walls are 13 inches thick, and the, that's why the front of it looks like a deli, and you why have to push the Gatorade to get in here. If I have to read another stupid art review in the New Yorker or the Times about, ooh, really, you know, this is breaking our preconceptions about this is very daring and bold. Really? An hour of this? I mean, you would just melt their brains, and if they had any balls, they would review it. Even to attack you. Well, the funny thing is it all sounds so benign to me. Like, uh, Pat Buchanan as a young man would beat up bullies. Sounds good. I would say that this uh, fits firmly into the counterculture uh, cabinet. Really? Yes, I would. This, just discussing this that? Progr this program in general. I'm and I mean that as a... That, sounds so, it, my, that last story seems so benign. It, oh, I love it! It, it could I, be in a children's book. I'm, I'm on your side 100%. Trust me. I just... I'm... <laughs> it's not... It's not what everyone else is saying. It would this be a, ducks instead of people, and it would be a duck with Down syndrome. But it could be a children's book. <laughs> okay. uh, Tucker, thanks for coming. Gavin, that was amazing. Appreciate it very much. We uncovered a lot of controversies here, and got to the bottom of pretty much everything except homosexuality and immigration. Till next time. That's what we'll do next time. Thanks for coming. Thanks, man.